clones, love affairs, friends dying for friends, solar systems being destroyed. Hellfire Club? She is flying through space with a giant bird made out of fire around her. She can take out any other superhero or supervillain. She just leaps out of the water with a new costume. She's got a little sash. Hear me, X-Men. No longer am I the woman you knew. Now and forever. I am Phoenix! There are thousands of comics out there in the world, but every once in a while there is an issue, an arc, a miniseries that's absolutely incredible. Dark Phoenix is one of those comics that blew our minds. My dad, he's really into comics, so I was kind of just looking through his stuff. I read the X-Men for the first time, and I really, really liked it. When I'm on stage, I feel powerful. I feel in control. I just get to unleash my power. I've re the computer since we're doing this on my laptop. I'm Jay Edidin. I'm a writer and editor, and I co-host the podcast Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men. I remember reading Claremont's X-Men run for the first time as, as a teenager. It was big. It was an incredibly good story. The cover was pretty intriguing. You can see this female looking like unstoppable and kind of like empowered. I remember as a kid, like the covers of comic books always make it look like, oh no, this character's gonna die for sure. And then it wouldn't happen. Dark Phoenix was definitely one of those stories that it, it didn't feel like it was a stunt. This story felt like it mattered, like we're really doing this. Who is Jean Grey? So Jean Grey, she's one of the original gangsters of the X-Men, 1960s style. She's just like a hot redhead for nerd boys to love. She's the Stanley 60s girl, which is to say that her main personality is girl. So the 60s, the Silver Age, would have been very, very shortly after the creation of the Comics Code Authority, which is a self-governing body within comics. And there were limits specifically on the extent to which women could be threatened or involved in physical altercations. The highest selling comics in America had been romance comics. And so when they were writing a woman into superhero teams or writing female characters into superhero teams, a lot of the time they got slotted into that romance role. Comics have come a long way in their depictions of women. When she started in the X-Men, when she like was first recruited. Professor X is like, uh, hey boys, uh, I got a really pretty young lady who's coming in now. And they all go to the window and they're like, ooh la la. Oh, cool, a girl. Hey students, I brought a girl to join the team. She's hot. A redhead? Look at that face and the rest of her. Beast assaults her. Beast like tries to kiss her. Oh no. He like hurls him off telekinetically. I think right now they kind of respect her a little bit more. It's like, whoa, this babe's got powers. And then very quickly it becomes, oh, Jean fainted again. She's a tendency to be kind of the weak one. She passes out a lot. It's too much to bear. And then she just, she faints and she's useless. Dan Lee kind of like lets this book, X-Men, go to the side. It's not really doing well. It's probably the worst selling book that Marvel's got for a minute. You've got Lem Wein comes in and he does this book called Giant Size X-Men number one. So Giant Size X-Men number one was a major, major shift for the title in a lot of ways. They got rid of some old characters, they brought in a lot of new characters. So you've got Storm, who's from Kenya, Banshee, who's Irish, Logan, who's Canadian, Colossus, who's Russian. Like, you've, you've got this team of international heroes who are fighting for a world that fears change. And then, Chris Claremont comes in. Claremont was going to go on to write X-Men and to really define the entire X-Line for the next 17 years. He was an incredible long game writer. You're going to see bits of, of even later plot lines that he's starting to lay in just from the very beginning of his run. He gave female characters interiority and relationships that weren't built around the men around them. The Phoenix Saga proper that begins with issue 98. They're out in space, the X-Men. Kidnapped by Stephen Lang. He's up on a space station, and he really hates mutants. He's a dick. One of the first things Gene says is, oh, hello, Lang. I didn't recognize you without your swastika. You barely look dressed without it. And she's like, just she's strung up and just like bad mouthing this dude. It's great. They fight, they win, they're gonna get away, but the ship is messed up. They're gonna die on re-entry because there's a big 
There's like a sonic space field wave. And it's impossible for whoever is flying the ship to also survive re-entry to Earth. And the person who's gonna like pilot it is going to die. Jean may be the most powerful and the only one who can save the day. That's a hard spot to be in. Jean is like, yeah, I'm gonna do it. You can't, you don't know how to fly. And so she's like, I do now. She like pulls pilot knowledge out of someone else's brain. And Scott's like, no, baby, you can't do this. You can't withstand it. And she's like, I must, Scott. I'm the only one. And then Cyclops is like, no, you're my love. I love you. Knocks Scott out. And then Storm and Wolverine are like, Jean, no, we love you. No, don't do it. Don't do it. She's like, if you love me, you'll let me love you back and save you. And she's using her telekinetic abilities to like keep the spaceship held together. You can feel her skin getting torn apart by radiation. And I think she's already accepted that she's going to die. So she just pilots it. They are barreling towards Earth plane going down into Jamaica Bay. The X-Men come up one by one, they're all alive, but you realize that Jean is probably dead. And then the water starts boiling and lights up and there's steam coming up and then... No longer am I the woman you knew. I am fire and life incarnate, now and forever. I am, I am Phoenix. Phoenix. Everyone's like, woo, Jean's back, but also seems incredibly different. You see her and it's like a completely different outfit. It's a quick costume change. Let's not ask her where she got the costume from. This is already weird already. I like it when the characters enjoy the fact that they wear costumes. I think uh, it's a choice and it's a pleasurable one. They could dress any way they wanted to. So like, you have to assume that like Wolverine dresses like that because he likes it. It's an age-old story. You're supposed to be dead. You came back from the dead. We're not going to question it, but we probably should. Jean's powers end up taking everyone through the Stargate. So they're having another space adventure. Imagine like if you could take like the entire Infinity Gauntlet and just make it like a big ass rock. And it is a nexus of all realities. And if it is destroyed, basically it turns into a black hole and sucks up all the realities into the black hole. And they fall into the center of the crystal. Jean notices that the crystal is cracked and fractured and it's hurting. She basically in that moment takes the universe and solders it back together. And when she does this, it is this astounding feeling where she just feels connected to everything. Like the scale of what she does in that scene is pretty much impossible to exaggerate. This is the power to create or end universes. Jean Grey goes from being the weakest, ostensibly, character in this sort of X-Men universe to becoming the strongest character by far. Scott Summers, Scott is very frightened of his girlfriend, but also very in love with his girlfriend. And Scott cries a lot. I mean, his power is pretty cool, but her power is like, she's a god. I'm gonna let you take off your visor. He's like, no, no, you can't do that. It'll be out of control, it'll destroy everything. She's like, no, no, I will control it for you. She makes it so that Scott can remove his ruby quartz glasses so she can look at his face. Then at that moment, he kind of realized Jean's true abilities. It's an insane power to take someone else's power away. And of course, if a woman is going to be exceptional in any way, some dude somewhere has to make it about his d Here's a fun fact. If you're a telepath, people are up in your sh constantly. Mastermind is a guy named Jason Wingard. He is an illusionist. He's got some telepathic abilities, and he is a huge creep. Jason Wingard can make you think that you are Beyonce, friends, and only Beyonce is Beyonce. He decides that he's gonna mind control her by sending her back into these flashbacks that look like romance novel covers. Him and the Hellfire Club want to control her and the Phoenix Force for their own gains towards world domination. The Hellfire Club is an organization of the CD elite who run the world. Whose whole thing seems to be some kinky role play based around anachronistic 18th century fashion. Marvel is a, is family entertainment. 
So the things they would actually be doing, where they would wear like beaky masks, everybody's like rubbing on everybody else. You can't even hint at. Fundamentally, they're just they're a bunch of doofuses. I just imagine that like, they have like, always have a buffet in there of some kind. It's fancy, but also like low quality. Like it's tablecloths, but like weird, gross snacks. Let's go take down these rich creeps! And as soon as they're there, Mastermind just goes right up to Jean and just like scoops her away from Scott and she's just immediately like, oh yeah, I'm back in a time slip. I'm with the man I love. And basically gets hoodwinked into being the queen of the Hellfire Club. He like went into her mind and created the illusions inside her mind. It felt more real to her because of her mind magic. They literally make Storm look like a runaway slave. Like, it is, it is a moment. And I'm just like, okay, I understand how dire this is. Cool, cool, cool. Cyclops and Mastermind fight a psychic duel. So Jason Wingard just like stabs him like right through his chest and Cyclops dies. <laughs> Not really. His psychic self gets murdered. So there's one thing you don't do with Jean Grey. Don't kill Scott Summers. It's just a thing that you shouldn't do. But that is enough to jar Jean out of whatever degree of mind control she's experiencing. And just get really angry. Immediately doing her I am fire, I am destruction thing. And she like corners Wingard. And pretty much funnels open his brain and pours in an entire cosmos's worth of awareness. And literally blows his mind. says she's now Dark Phoenix. And she is gonna f shit up. New outfit, completely different facial expressions. Phoenix is out of control at this point. Uh, like Colossus, she just like takes away his power and he was lifting up this tree and then she like makes it solid gold. <laughs> I think throwing a tree, making someone not tree carrying capable, Having a helper help with the tree and making the tree gold is one of the craziest things I've ever read in any comic ever. It's like, why are we even talking about this tree? She could have made it any other like thing that's heavy, but I like that she chose solid gold because I just feel like it's so extra. And she just flies into space. She's hungry. And she heads out to space and feeds off a star. Flies into the center of it and just absorbs it all. And I relate to this because I will sometimes uh, buy things in the grocery store when I'm hungry. And I think that I'm gonna eat them over a, a reasonable period of time. And then I will eat all of it. Unfortunately, this is a star that is orbited by a number of planets, one of which is populated. They show like a, a quick glimpse of, of them. They're like these weird asparagus looking people. And without their son, they, they die. She just killed an entire solar system. Behind the scenes, Jim Shooter and some of the other folks um, that were working at Marvel at the time were pissed off um, that Gene had committed genocide, even though it was asparagian genocide. This was actually kind of an accident. Uh, the original script, Claremont just had it destroying the planet, uh, Byrne drew people in some of the panels. They were really mad about it. That was a story they didn't want to do. One of the coolest things that has ever happened in comic book history, we saw one of our most loved heroes go full villain. Dark Phoenix is feeling great though. She, she got her lunch. This kills all these aliens and she's feeling great about it. But now the aliens are outraged. She's committed this huge intergalactic war crime. On her way back to Earth, she also encounters a Shi'ar warship. And she destroys them, like that. That puts her on the radar of the Shi'ar Empire and they head to Earth to deal with what's going on because they recognize the Phoenix Force. The Phoenix Force is something nicknamed Chaos Bringer. In their cosmology, it's been around for a long time and yeah, it eats stars, so that's kind of an issue. Dark Phoenix goes back to her old neighborhood. She goes back to her childhood home. Her family's there, but she can read all their minds. So even though they're being nice, she's like, they're scared of me now. They're a little terrified of her. 
and she's just overcome with, with Jean's memories and Jean's feelings, and then she says, no, I don't want this, this is, feelings are stupid. Then she starts getting mad about that, so she's like, look what I can do to your houseplants. So she like, freezes one of their houseplants, she's like, I can do that to you. Her dad says, I disown you, I cast you out! Like he's performing an exorcism. I think if my daughter came home and I knew that she'd been going through a lot, and then she damaged one of my houseplants, I don't think I would disown her as quickly as he disowns her. I deny you, I cast you out. He's very extra as well, I might run in the family. And Dark Phoenix is like, you don't get to cast me out, I cast you out. At which point the X-Men show up and everyone fights. The X-Men just will not give up on their girl. That's one of the things I love about the X-Men. Have you ever had that friend where he's like, I'm just not gonna give up on you? That's the X-Men and Jean Grey. And then Scott comes in and he's like, I'm gonna try something else. Obviously I can't take you in battle, so I'm gonna appeal to your heart. And breaks through to Jean. And he almost manages it, except that Charles Xavier decides that the only force greater than love is condescending paternalism. So it's a big battle because it's like, you do mind stuff, I do mind stuff. You have a big mind fight. You've got Professor X, her mentor, who has to come in and subdue her. And like, you have this glorious moment where everyone is happy, Jean is back. And then some alien just like beams all of the X-Men to this planet. And Jean's family is like, I feel very bad for every family member of the X-Men. I love the fact that Jimmy Carter is in the Dark Phoenix saga. I love that uh, Jimmy Carter is like concerned that like there was some ruckus at the Hellfire Club and he's like, An energy force of unknown origins but considerable power is approaching Earth. This is some extraterrestrial attack. I want the Avengers ready to deal with it. I like seeing him thrust into this world where he's just really having to deal with the fact that there are possible aliens and like Carter's on it. This brings us to X-Men 137, which for a lot of people is the definitive issue of X-Men. It's drawn by John Byrne, written by Chris Claremont, both of their best work. It's the kind of issue that you can read and read and come back to 10 years later and read and read again and still tear up every time. So they get transported to the Shi'ar who are like, hey, uh, we have footage of Jean committing genocide. Yeah, all those space folks, they're pretty pissed off. They think uh, genocide is bad, hot take. Take that one to Twitter, folks. The Empress, she was like, oh, guess we need to kill her now. The X-Men are not cool with this. Professor Xavier tells them that there is another option, trial by combat. The X-Men can face the Imperial Guard for Phoenix's life. They have like this night to like rest. They're just like living it up before the battle. They all get to do like take relaxing showers and they get massages and they're treated really well. They, they all have sort of a collective long dark night of the soul. Ah, oh, I love Jean, but she did kill all those people. Hmm. Is she actually bad and are we fighting for the wrong team? Or are we fighting for the teammate that we once knew? Of course, like they all they all do. They all decide the next day that they're gonna fight that they're gonna fight for her. Beast is he's wrestling with this and then all of a sudden like uh, he gets a room service, like a, a masseuse comes in, he's like, oh boy. Behind the scenes there's this conversation, right? What are we gonna do with Jean Grey? There was this idea that Jim Shooter had, which was that she would become imprisoned for all time. Chris Claremont was like, I can't do that because then the whole rest of the story for the X-Men until that changes is gonna be them trying to get her back 24 seven. That's all they're gonna be on. One of the defining parts of any superhero is their costume. Chris, Luis, Byrne, they all knew this moment was coming. The readers might not have known, but they knew and they wanted to pay homage. She went into battle dressed as Marvel Girl. Final costume change. Going back to the beginning, going full circle. In the Marvel Universe, there's a chunk of the moon that was previously occupied and has a breathable atmosphere and also a bunch of ancient, I think mostly Cree ruins, including a lot of old weaponry. Very, very powerful weaponry. 
they 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 fight all of the Shi'ar fighters. Different creatures show up for the fight. It's like new weird things they're having to fight. They're like, I'm the, this kind of new thing. And everybody's powerful, so nobody's powerful. And they are just massively, massively outmatched. Sometimes you lose. Bad. Real bad. Marvel Girl and Cyclops are together, and Cyclops gets hurt, and Phoenix reemerges in response to that. Not Dark Phoenix, just regular Phoenix. Still terrifying, but kind of good. And Jean massively turns the tables. She finds that strength within herself, and that triggers immense cosmic strength. Phoenix has come back. Phoenix has taken down the Imperial Guard. And Jean says, look, we're, we're in this area, and there's this massive piece of old Kree weaponry. This is going to keep happening. If I hang around long enough, I'm going to eat the sun, and all the X-Men are going to die, and it'll be my fault. She's going to kill Spider-Man, and she's going to kill everybody. I mean, not everybody, but like most people. It's an endless cycle. Jean turns to Phoenix, turns to Dark Phoenix, turns back to Jean. This will not stop unless I stop it. And Scott's like, no, like, what are you talking about? And she's like, this is the only way, Scott. It's the only way. And then she basically uses a piece of Shi'ar machinery and kills herself. The last thing that she did with her powers was destroy herself so she couldn't hurt any other innocent people. She's died so many times that I was expecting her to live, but she didn't live this time. She could have solved world hunger. She could have made anything, like she can rearrange molecules. She could have done so much good, but instead she was seen as a threat and had to be destroyed. And that for a long, long time was the end of Jean Grey. She disappeared from X-Men comics for about five and a half years. Like a lot of readers were really upset when they killed off Jean Grey, but to be able to take a risk really is what they were looking for at that time because it took the X-Men to another level. The X-Men weren't prior to this, right? This is the story that really puts them on the map. The hardest thing I think to do is to kill a character and never bring them back. And they have brought Dark Phoenix back, but I think it's one of those things where whenever they do, they usually will make the same decision that now, you can't bring the character back without betraying the whole point of the character, which is this character can't exist. I do like her character, and I like that she kind of changes in maybe a way that isn't beneficial for the group. One of the things I like most about Jean Grey is that she's not perfect. She is not necessarily an aspirational figure. She is complex, she is thorny. Women often have to put on a face of being perfect, especially when we're working with a lot of men and we're like the only woman and have to be a stand-up example of femininity, but also not be too great. I was like, oh man, she just like gets me. I think for the time that it came out, specifically for the 70s and 80s, it was something like we'd never seen before. One of the best-selling stories of all time. It ranks up there, hands down, top five. My only criticism of the entire Dark Phoenix saga is that President Jimmy Carter didn't play a larger role in the outcome. Because I would have liked, I would have liked to have seen Jimmy Carter like come in and like shut down the Hellfire Club. Because I don't think he would have, I don't think he would have approved of that club. I don't think he liked those guys. Uh, yeah.